The first time we see adult salmon returning from their ocean feeding is at the river mouth. They have traveled thousands of miles across open sea with its disorientating currents and returned to the same river they started from. An exceptional feat of navigation. It's around this time in June that the first bars of silver are seen splashing in the sea. This leaping behavior and their ability to clear obstacles such as waterfalls is why the salmon acquired its Latin name, Salmo Salar, the leaper. There are several theories as to why salmon leap. Some think they're trying to rid themselves of these tiny parasites known as sea lice. Others believe they're leaping for joy or communicating their presence to other salmon. One thing's for certain. If they couldn't leap, they would not be able to ascend the weirs and waterfalls they'll encounter en route to the spawning areas. So perhaps they're just practicing for the riggers ahead. For four months, while the salmon run the river, the lives of many in this small community change dramatically. Fishing lodges and guest houses open up. Sea and night patrols to protect the salmon from illegal fishing begin, but perhaps it's the fly fishermen who anticipate their arrival most. Salmon enter Britain's major rivers during nearly every month of the year. However, here in the Hebrides, nearly all the adult salmon return in the summer months from June through to September. The vast majority are known as grills, fish which have spent only one winter feeding at sea. Larger salmon, which may have spent two or more winters at sea, are uncommon here. These salmon will remain in shoals, roaming around the bay until they enter fresh water where they will revert to a more solitary territorial existence. They require rainfall and the subsequent high water levels in order to ascend these small, steep rivers. In periods of dry weather, which frequently coincide with the return of the summer salmon, they cannot enter fresh water. Instead, they congregate around estuaries in large shoals. This bottlenecking is a dangerous time, as they are highly visible and a relatively easy target for natural predators, particularly humans. The salmon don't know much about this and are compelled to act on their instinct to enter fresh water as soon as they can. This is not as easy as it sounds, since the river is unique in its geology and poses its own set of problems for returning fish. The main obstacle is that they have to wait for the right conditions to make it across the shallow beach into the deeper pools of the river. The water in the river channel is barely a foot deep at low tide and is ever changing, meandering as the elements coax it one way or the other. But it always holds the deepest water at high or low tide. This is the route the salmon will follow. Every day, twice a day, the tide and the open water it provides floods the sands. And twice a day, it recedes. The internal battle between the salmon's instinct to ascend into fresh water and the equally strong instinct to avoid the danger of shallow water put them in something of a quandary. The outcome of this is that for the most part, they follow the tide in. Then, as the tide drops, they linger in the ebbing current as long as they dare before withdrawing and regrouping in a safer spot. Notice how the salmon lie facing the current, whichever way the tide flows. They're behaving in a similar manner as to when in the river. Only when the river is in spate, following heavy rain or during a spring tide, will a significant number of fish brave the shallow channel 
to their freshwater refuge. Rain is somewhat unpredictable, though fairly regular here in the Western Isles. Tides, on the other hand, are entirely predictable in every way. There are spring tides twice a lunar month, as the sun and moon align pulling together on the ocean. When high river levels and spring tides coincide, it's likely that most of the fish lingering in the estuary will reach fresh water. Until this happens, the fly fishers who come here from all over the world embrace the unusual practice of fishing for wild Atlantic salmon in salt water. Fly fishing in the sea can feel and look a little unnatural to start with, but years of experimenting have proved it can be very exciting and rewarding. Essentially, the trick is to present a fish with an irresistible opportunity to take your lure or fly. This is not as easy as it sounds. Remember, these fish are not feeding and are easily spooked in the shallow water. They're also moving with the tide in across the beach and back out again twice a day. The whole thing might seem hopeless, but anglers are a committed lot and collectively have come up with some pretty clever ploys. There are two main strategies used here, the group ambush and the more demanding stalking method. A lot of time is spent waiting for the salmon to come within range of the shore because it's impossible to follow shoals of fish around the bay. It follows that there's no point casting your fly to where the fish aren't and that in order to have any chance of tempting a salmon, the fish must be able to see your fly. Ambushing and stalking have the same aim, to present the fish with an opportunity to see your fly and maybe take it. Basically, the more often you present your fly to the fish, the more chance you have of catching one. Yeah. Oh, he's got it. Well done. Years of accumulated knowledge of where and when salmon are likely to pause the longest has made this piece of water popular, especially on the ebbing tide. We know the shoals will pass here, sometimes lingering for several hours somewhere along this deep channel. The shore is easily accessible and there are no obstacles to get snagged on, but the slippery seaweed underfoot makes wading dangerous, so having several anglers positioned strategically as opposed to one running up and down is far safer. Arranging several anglers side by side ensures the salmon can be fished over wherever they are in the channel. The group is working as a team. The inexperienced young boy is just as likely to have a fish in front of him as the seasoned expert. Everyone enjoys the success of others, especially someone catching their first fish. Ultimately, the angler, no matter how competent, relies on the fish to make the first move. Experience teaches us that this is more likely to happen under certain conditions, but there are no absolutes in salmon fishing. The conditions which theoretically offer the angler the best chance of finding a fish in taking mood also make it difficult to cast. Ideal conditions here include a brisk wind, overcast or broken skies, moderate tide rip and slightly discoloured cool water. Salmon also seem more likely to take when holding position against the tidal current. As in a river, it's uncommon to entice a travelling fish. Oh, Come on. God, he didn't take it. Come on. A calm day with blue skies and crystal clear water may make spotting fish and casting a fly easy, but also makes it easier for the fish to see the angler, the line landing, and the fly for what it is. Warm water and the low oxygen levels that result also make salmon both lethargic and unsettled. 
These fish aren't going to be caught today. But just try and stop this lot from trying. Stalking shoals of fish along the shoreline is more difficult than being part of the ambush team. But the rewards can be higher for the adventurous individual. It's handy having someone nearby with a landing net, because beaching a fish here takes on a whole different meaning. It's useful having someone positioned high on the cliff, spotting the shoals of fish, as this is virtually impossible from water level. This fisherman can't see any of these fish except when they leap. If, as in this case, the shoal settles out of range, there's no way of getting closer on foot until the tide turns. But what a beautiful way to be frustrated. This tireless predator doesn't know when to give in, going to great lengths to get near the fish in this craft known as a belly boat. By using a belly boat, it's possible to get near fish in deep water without a boatman and to have your hands free in order to fish. Belly boats are also easy to carry in a backpack to remote areas before blowing them up. It's always advisable to have friends nearby, of course, and to wear a buoyancy aid in case of unforeseen difficulties. This hunter's cunning has helped him hook a salmon in the North Atlantic, though the local sheep don't seem too impressed. <laughs> when things go well and the fish is hooked, the battle begins. But you can't just reel them in. First, you have to tire the fish out, being careful not to get overexcited or allow the fish to tangle you in the seaweed. Salmon of this size can take anywhere between five and 20 minutes to bring in. The bigger ones might take over an hour. Many an anxious moment passes during the fight. And when, finally, the net swings under the prize, there's a sense of achievement in succeeding against the odds. As a bonus, fish caught in the sea are as beautiful to look at and as delicious to eat as any you could imagine. Heavy rain is forecast and spring tide imminent. The salmon will soon make it into the river across the sands. These anglers know that the next hour or so is going to be their last chance to catch salmon in the sea for a whole year. As expected, rain did coincide with the tide, and most of the salmon pushed up into the river. Some didn't make it all the way to their deep water refuge and are trapped in these small pools on the beach. For the fish, it's only a minor inconvenience, delaying their passage by no more than a few hours until the next tide. But for the fishermen, it offers yet another opportunity. 